JetBrains just held this big Kotlin 1.4 event. A new release of F5 is coming in November, and Raul Raha of Aerofame talks with us about quarantines. This is Lambda World News. Welcome to Lambda World News, the show where we bring you the latest news and the most interesting ideas from the functional programming community. Later, Raul Raha, one of the Aero maintainers for Kotlin, will talk with us about recent developments on coroutines, suspensions, and continuations. But for now, here's what's in the news. Because of who our guest is today, it's fitting to start off the news by mentioning the latest release of Kotlin. JetBrains announced the release of Kotlin 1.4 back on August 17th, a release focused on overall performance and quality improvements, adding elements like a new Kotlin compiler, introducing SAM conversions for Kotlin interfaces, and the ability to add trailing commas in argument lists. But the special Kotlin 1.4 online event just took place October 12th through the 15th. The completely free four-day virtual event highlighted the changes and improvements introduced in version 1.4 and featured talks and Q&A sessions with the Kotlin developer team. All the videos from that event are available on the JetBrains YouTube channel. JetBrains also announced this month that going forward, it's shifting to date-driven Kotlin releases rather than feature-driven releases meaning that new versions of Kotlin will be released every six months, rather than waiting for big language features before releasing new updates. Swift got an update recently, with better error messaging, build time and runtime improvements, and enhanced code compilation performance and quality. Swift 5.3 continues its focus on improving the developer experience and refining the language overall. New Haskell's version 0.4 released on October 14th, the latest version of this library for developing a microservices architecture adds support for all the major communications protocols, gRPC, GraphQL, and now REST or OpenAPI, and it adds support for logging, metrics, and distributed tracing, key components for a healthy services infrastructure. A new version of f -sharp, the open source cross-platform FP language for .NET, will ship alongside the new .NET 5, which is making its debut on November 10th at the virtual .NET Conf 2020. We got a peek at some of the new additions to f -sharp 5 in its August preview. Highly requested string interpolation is finally in, but the big game changer is support for custom keywords and computation expressions, opening the door for much nicer domain-specific languages. A new version of Erlang's scalable enterprise instant messaging solution, Mongoose IM, is now out. Mongoose IM 4.0 introduces a new configuration format. It now uses the TOML file format to simplify the syntax and make Mongoose IM more accessible and easier to use. This release also introduced structured logging, along with other new features and extensions that enhance what Erlang Solutions describes as the most robust, scalable, and now easiest to configure instant messaging solution available on the market. Work continues on the highly anticipated Dotty project, bringing it so close to graduating to Scala 3. In late September, the official Dotty blog reported that the next release of Dotty, which was scheduled for October 1st, would become Scala 3, but as of the date we're recording this in late October, the most recent release of Dottie is still version 0.26. However, despite this global pandemic, the Scala Center is still determined to have a Scala 3 release candidate for you before the end of the year. With the current roadmap, that makes Dottie scheduled to become Scala 3 in December. Now, let's quickly spotlight a few recent books that might interest you. Algorithm Design with Haskell by Jeremy Gibbons and Richard Bird. Things You Need to Know About JVM That Matter in Scala by Matus Kabusik and Production Haskell, Succeeding in Industry with Haskell by Matt Parsons. Algorithm Design with Haskell is available now on Amazon. Things You Need to Know About JVM That Matter in Scala is still being edited by the author, but it's currently offered in an early access format. Production Haskell, Succeeding in Industry with Haskell is also available as an in-progress release. And let's finish the news today by highlighting some upcoming conferences. This year, the Reactive Summit and Scale by the Bay have teamed up, virtually of course, and will happen one after another in mid-November. You can find out more information about these conferences at scale.bythebay.io and reactivesummit.org. The virtual Haskell Exchange 2020 takes place November 4th through the 5th, 
and you can go to skillsmatters.com for more information. Finally, JLove, a new conference focused on Java, takes place December 4th through the 5th, and all the details for that are at jlove.confi.care. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Maureen. Today, we're happy to have with us Raul Raja, CTO of 47 Degrees and one of the maintainers of the Arrow Library, which brings concepts such as lanterns and functors to the world of Kotlin. Lately, they have been playing with the built-in support for coroutines offered by the Kotlin compiler itself to build a new version of their effects library. All the players in our community are looking at these same ideas, so who better to give us an overview? Welcome, Raul. Thanks for making some time in your VC agenda to chat about functional programming and in particular about coroutines. So let me start with, with uh, a question. So Kotlin uh, started with coroutines since day one, if I, if I understand correctly, and Scala is thinking about it, about adding them. And you have Project Loom in Java trying to bring continuations to JVM. So uh, can you give us like a bird's eye view of what you know, all, all this coroutine is about? Uh, hi, Alejandro, and thanks for, for having me. Uh, of course, uh, in the case of uh, coroutines, uh, we, are, we are seeing coroutines that are becoming popular uh, in many languages, uh, especially in Kotlin. Uh, so in Kotlin, besides having coroutines, which is, uh, you can think of it as a way in which your program can yield control to perform an operation uh, to this uh, runtime, and then you have uh, primitives or uh, methods or functions which you can call to complete uh, that computation and then go back to the point uh, and resume the program. So that gives you the ability to uh, encode uh, a bunch of idioms, among others, uh, monadic uh, for comprehension, denotation style, uh, but directly over an imperative uh, style. So this is what they're becoming very popular in Kotlin, not just because they have the notion of coroutines or the notion of the limited uh, continuations uh, in the language, but also because the language cooperates with uh, the sugaring that allows people to write those functions in such a way that they don't need to use uh, callbacks or indirection in order to perform classic monadic computations such as bind, uh, also known as flat map uh, and others. So syntactically, they solve uh, a lot of uh, problems and simplify the usage of a lot of the data types in, in Kotlin. And it, it is uh, uh, not something novel in terms of like, uh, you know, the first language with continuations. Even Scala before had first class uh, continuations at some point, which was later uh, retracted. And now there's a revamp proposal for a sync away, which is effectively similar to continuations. Um, so and let, let me let me go yeah. in some of the things you've you've mentioned. So so you've mentioned that Kotlin has like support and uh, the sugar ins for continuation. So that's actually one of the worries I've uh, you know you often heard for people. Do we have to change our code to use continuation? So how how has been your experience? You know working with with first class coroutines in Kotlin. Is that the case? No, that's uh, that's not the case because uh, at the end of the day, continuations, regardless of what the user writes in terms of syntax, for example, in this case would be simply a function denoted as suspended in Kotlin, uh, it ends up being compiled into a function of an argument. So if effectively, uh, the resulting code and the resulting uh, everything that is happening behind the scenes the compiler is doing is transforming this imperative uh, style into a callback style that you could consider reactive. But the nice thing about the compiler being aware of this uh, problem or this notion of suspension or continuations or I.O., which is what the, the biggest use case for that in Kotlin is, uh, is that the compiler actually specializes the user functions to be more performant instead of uh, unlike in other languages where you, if you're working with I.O., uh, for example, in the Scala I.O.s like Zio, uh, Cats, uh, Effect, and the others, you end up having to model your program in a series of uh, classes or CL hierarchies that serves as a data structure to put that computation into memory, 
then later when you run it, you're effectively folding that data structure and advancing the computation. But in Kotlin, that is not necessary because the compiler is aware which functions are part of those effects and it knows how to specialize them and put them in an effective, super fast uh, uh, actual loop. Um, so it brings uh, screaming fast performance also to this uh, style. And this is mainly what we are interested, just not because the notion of continuations, continuations have been around forever, even in Scala. We have uh, Conti implementations in CAT. Uh, we've known about uh, that power in Haskell uh, that you can pretty much model this in, in this style too. But the, what makes it fast and what makes it uh, extremely important in the current years uh, is like that the compiler acknowledges that and is able to disagree that in such a way that does not have the allocation uh, and the garbage collection cost that a data structure with in memory will have. Okay, and, so and that's that's what you are sort of taking uh, you know advantage of in your arrow effects because if I understand correctly in in arrow which is like a functional programming library for for Kotlin. You are putting all of this in the work to have like a super fast IO type, right? That's what ArrowFX is trying to do. Yes, ArrowFX coroutines. Uh, well, ArrowFX started as a library which we introduced the uh, IO data type similar to encoding found in CATS, and it was inspired mostly by the one in, in CATS. And uh, we've uh, quickly discovered. Um, you know, there is some limitations to this encoding once we benchmark and we saw the problems with left binds and with the stack safety and so on. And then we also discovered at the same time that suspension effectively in Kotlin gave you the intrinsics to build primitives such as uh, reset and shift that would allow us to further uh, explore this model. So that discovery basically uh, made us realize that our enc the encoding for IO and Kotlin was incorrect. Therefore, we didn't need an actual data structure since the language acknowledged these primitives. And then secondly, that these uh, primitives were not only just useful to IO, but all other data types like list uh, and others, since uh, with suspension, you can also model uh, monad bind for those data types as well. So RFX came together as a library to try to make a fast screaming IO. And this a few things that make it fast. One of them is, as I mentioned, the, the use case that the Kotlin compiler specializes user code. So that is a, a great uh, use case, and that's like the majority of the speed, but there is other improvement we realize when we change styles as well. For example, by having continuations and by having imperative syntax for effect tracking in, in this IO, we are able to entirely ignore all the functor hierarchy for I.O. in terms of methods like map, flat map, and everything all the way up to the async uh, combinators. This is because uh, really if you have in place monad bind, that essentially means you can pretty much do all what other, those other methods already do in the environment without the indirection of functions. Removing that indirection actually results in a higher performance boost because all the code that before was just uh, declared as uh, mostly uh, functional because it required a function passing style, which in the JVM comes with a price. Uh, in this case, it resulted more in a stack style code, which for most use cases, uh, it's much faster to to run in the JVM than doing invoke and, and virtual dispatches through abstractions. So that was another big performance win that, that we found. And ultimately we found that the reset and shift uh, primitives allows us to build more powerful libraries like effect handlers and other abstractions that uh, up until this point, uh, without this continuation style or this continuation power, we were not able to encode. But now having discovered this, we realized that most of the other concerns we had about higher kinds and other features the language was missing are not uh, such since the continuation monad really allows you to deal with all of those and encoding is really fast, so. Okay, so uh, just as a, as a last question. So we, we've been talking and you mentioned that, that you know, uh, continuation have been, uh, well, it's uh, 
old things from from Scheme, and you have uh, books from the 80s about compiling with continuations, but nowadays Kotlin includes them, and, and I don't know, uh, Haskellers are also looking at the limited continuation. There are some proposals, so... So, uh, you know, this, this question is more like, how do you see the future? Do you think that, that the moment for continuation, like for mainstream use for this concept has, has uh, come? Or how do you see the future? Do you, do you think this is going to be mainstream or just mostly for, for uh, um, designers of libraries? Uh, how do you see the field? I think uh, uh, effectively has uh, already come in the sense of uh, we cannot ignore the fact that major frameworks such as Spring Boot, uh, Android, and many other big players uh, of communities that are pretty big and they are a big part of the Java ecosystem in terms of development are already using these continuations in a form or another. And they are actually using them with suspending Kotlin, which gives you those intrinsics and that safety that every suspend function is equivalent to being inside the IO model in terms of composition, value passing, and all that. So that's already happening. This is not something uh, we need to wait for or say uh, it's actually the other way around. I think in this case, what's happened is that Kotlin has gone forward and has a specialized technique that everyone was thinking about in terms of abstraction and what it could do and abstractions, and they have made it concrete to a particular use case, which is people are writing these kinds of programs, and then there is all this boilerplate that is getting in the way. So that's already in the industry, and it can potentially be that it's already being used by a bigger size of developers than the entire functional programming communities of Haskell, Scala, and or uh, other languages just because of the adoption of these other frameworks like Spring, Android, and so on. With that said, uh, I think, yes, it's a good time because it's not just so much about the performance or even the notion that you can model a, lo a lot of abstraction with this. But in my opinion, the biggest feature is that with this style, you can bring imperative-like programming with all the defect uh, guarantees that you have with functional uh, fun uh, programming based on function passing style. And this is a much friendlier approach that bridges the gap between communities like the OP community and the other communities that are already used to this uh, style uh, of programming. So it's a win for both places because it brings more people to functional programming and makes uh, also the code of what people that come from imperative programming safer because it's now tracking and making sure you're not just like uh, blowing up effects all over the place, but in a control, uh, you know, continuation style environment. Okay, great. So uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for giving us such a great overview of how things are going and how you are putting this in concrete use. Uh, well, so thanks for, for joining us today. Thank you, Alejandro. It was my pleasure. Take care. Thanks for joining us today for Lambda World News. If you have a news item, a book, or an upcoming event or conference you'd like us to mention on a future episode, send the info to us for consideration at lambda.world at 47deg.com.